Well, aside from unpacking all the goods and chattels that I had brought from India, the ridiculous amount of stuff, actually, to sort of short myself up, most of it with um, all the feel of England about it, it has to be said. I can honestly say that after the first the Eucharist I attended, uh, of celebrating, um, I knelt down and gave thanks for my predecessors and prayed for them. Because one of the things I think um, I'm very conscious of as a priest, as a bishop, as a Christian, is that you stand in a long stream that has been flowing for 2,000 years, and in this particular place, for 165 years. And um, you know, one sows, says the Bible, one sows, another reaps. And sometimes I've learned over the years, because I've been ordained a long time now, and I've watched parishes, particularly in my time as a bishop in England, that have waxed and waned a bit. And sometimes when they've been at a low ebb, it can be a sort of assumed that that's because of unfaithfulness. That can be the easy way. When in fact it can be much more mysterious than that. And it may be that the sacrifices and the, the sense of not getting far um, has, has been a ground softening thing in readiness for whatever comes next. Um, and I feel keenly about this because when I was a young priest, and the first time I was a parish priest, um, I went to a parish which didn't have a very large congregation and had a bit of an unhappy time. And um, uh, I was, with my first time, I was 27, I'd only been ordained three years. And of course, I was going to be the best parish priest that ever existed in the whole history of the world. And, and there was some growth. And I was uh, both inside myself and sometimes verbally with others uh, disdainful of my predecessor. And I'm ashamed of that now, actually. Whatever his ministry, it seems to me as I matured and um, hopefully learned a little bit more about the way the Lord works, um, that actually he um, had, um, perhaps even unbeknown to himself, softened the ground. And made it easier for me as the person who came. And I feel that very strongly um, about my, particularly my immediate predecessors here. Um, because as many of you know, uh, when I came, it, it, it was not a huge congregation, some lovely people, but, but it was a small and wondering where it was going to go. Um, and there had been a bit of division. Um, so I felt having sensed that, that it was important for me anyway to, to just give thanks for all that had been before. And maybe I've grown up a bit, I didn't need to keep comparing. I had a church warden in that parish in London. Every year I used to produce statistics, okay? Um, they were, I enjoyed it because they were all gross statistics as it happens in my time. Um, towards the end, I got a bit bored with it because actually, instead of the numbers going up, I heard your story. <laughs> so I became, but, but one year, uh, after I produced these statistics of comparing with my predecessor's time and my own, um, uh, the church warden, who'd been church warden longer than I was alive, I think, said to me, Father, we don't need to keep having these numbers, you know. You don't need to keep doing this. So I, I was sort of working out of my own security, trying to um, prove something at the expense of a priest who had sought to be faithful. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's really important actually for any parish in going forward. We give thanks for what has been and pray expectantly for and don't make these really false and, and generally ungodly comparisons. So that was the first thing um, that I did. And then it took some time to come to terms with the fact that I was no longer in England. <laughs> and I remember I went to preach somewhere. Uh, we had a joint even song with another parish in Essendon. And I was flying off to England that day, uh, that night. 
So I said, started by saying, now, my homily is going to be slightly short because I've got to get to Heathrow. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, someone did rather take me to task on that, saying, you haven't left there yet. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't left there yet. So I was still, um, mm. uh, so it took some time before I did what is necessary, and that is to say, this is where I am meant to be, or even if it isn't, this is where I am, and this is where I'm called to be faithful. Um, and that's true not only for a, for a priest, but certainly for a priest, but it's true for a member of the congregation. We're all in places for a fair certain amount of time, some a long time, some a short time, but while we're there, we have to trust this is where God wants us to be. And um, otherwise you just a restless. And actually there's not restlessness out, out there without the church being restless, let alone grumbling. So that was the first thing uh, that I did, I guess. And you talked there about tradition and what goes before. And I have a question about one of the words you've used to describe this conversation. You said about building an old-fashioned church. It's not a word that gets used a lot in a, to describe oneself. What is an old-fashioned church, and why do we want to build one? Okay, I think that's a good question. I'm glad you've asked it. Um, uh, last Easter, actually, when uh, on Easter Day, I think it was, when I was baptizing and confirming, which had been a lovely thing for me as a bishop, um, I said that someone had said, the thing about, to me in the street, or maybe in the cafe, the thing about the church is just so old fashioned. And I maybe I'm starting to think of it. Yes, 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 I am. I am old fashioned. I remember once at a meeting of the Bishop seen the staff here, and someone said something which I thought was, um, well, well, I didn't think too much of it. And I said um, to the Archbishop, I said, call me old fashioned Archbishop. And he said, yes, we do. <laughs> yes, we do. Yes, we do. Uh, what do I mean by that? I mean that we are a community that is fashioned, made, not by what's going on now in the world, or even necessarily the ups and downs of life in the church church in 2024. We are a community that is formed by 2,000 years of continuous life. We can even say that the church is just one generation. However long the church lasts until the Lord returns, it's one generation of people who are in Christ. And therefore, those who have gone before us are not just people who have gone before, they're not just our ancestors, but they're our contemporaries in the life of faith. Which is why in our tradition, we have a great sense of the saints and the company of heaven. And every, every mass, every Eucharist, we say, therefore with angels and archangels and the whole company of heaven. They're constantly reminded. You go into our old-fashioned church and you'll see stained glass windows with saints in it and icons and the whole works reminding us that what we do is in continuity. It's not a blind continuity, it's a trust in continuity. And if if someone from the second century could get in a, um, a TARDIS, you know, that, isn't that the, the, the TARDIS, that, what's the, the, the Doctor Who machine that takes him through time? If someone from the second century could come into Christchurch and say, hey, these are my peeps. <laughs> these are my people. <laughs> they haven't invented anything new. There's nothing novel here. It's renewing. We're doing what the people of God always do. And it seems to me, when I say we're old-fashioned, we are formed. Hello, come in, come in, come in. No, it's fine. Um, we, are, we are formed by uh, an abiding tradition. Um, of course, tradition is not static, but it has a continuity about it. That's what I mean about if someone from the second century could come. I mean, there'd be all sorts of things they'd be amused by if they saw one of these things filming or something. <laughs> Well, they saw electric light, they'd be confused. But they would hear the same gospel being read by the deacon or someone, or someone else. The same text. The same text. And there would be no better gift that they could receive except the gift of red and light. So we're doing what's always been done. And some people say, well, that's a bit monotonous. Can't we just have a zoomed up stuff? And I say, well, um, why not? Why not beer? But it could never replace those things. 
Well, I've only this to elucidate those gaps. <coughs> this is, it seems to me, the heart of the strength of the church. And when the church um, drifts away from it, from that, that 2,000 year tradition, which may be a 3,000 year, 4,000, 5,000 years. Someone would say, well, the church is going to have egg on its face if it's still existing in 10,000 years. Why? The Lord will come in his own time, thank you very much. It took billions of years before he came the first time. So why do we think we should hurry him up? But as long as we are continuing with the scripture and the regular bread, the sacraments of the church, which are animated by the Holy Spirit, so they're forever young, it will keep the church forever young. However old you are, however old you are, these gifts have the capacity to animate, animate our lives. And I believe very strongly that the church needs to recover its trust in those things. There are all sorts of other things the church can do, but not out of a lack of trust or the, 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 the mystery of God revealing himself in his word and God revealing himself in the sacramental life of the church and within the fellowship of believers, within the Philadelphia the company of believers. You know, we have this lovely tradition where we use incense. You know, I'll call that old fashioned. Actually, loads of people are burning joss sticks and then you know, smoking something else. And you know, so, I mean, it's not it's not, not, incense, oh, not incense, but <laughs> well, you see, I'm so naive. The, but, <laughs> okay, you know, when, when we have incense, we, we are constantly reminded of where we will find Christ. How the gospel is sensed. It's not just a, a sort of empty ritual, it's to remind us. And to honor the word of God. And then, of course, um, wonderful moment when the thoroughfare this morning, the thoroughfare almost banged into the children coming back from uh, Tell me about Sunday school. <laughs> <laughs> that was you. <laughs> I thought, oh no, there's going to be a mighty crash if one of the kids loses all their teeth in the thoroughfare. <laughs> uh, um, there's a wonderful moment when the person doing the incense turns to the congregation, having sensed the priests. The priests get no more than anybody else. It's the same incense. And our sense, why? To remind us that we are called to find Christ in each other. And once you've stopped hunting for Christ in another person, you've lost your vocation as a Christian. That, that's just the case. And then, and then, of course, the altar itself, and then the blessed sacrament, when it's lifted, when it's consecrated, is sense. It gets all more doubles, more than anyone else, but even more than a bishop gets more swings, because this is the place of divine encounter. Now, we are not free to change that. Why? Because we didn't invent them. We did not invent the sacrament. Paul is very clear. It's one of my favorite passages. There are only, only two times when Paul says, I hand on to you that which was handed on to me. Not something St. Paul invented, but something that was handed on to him. One is the, okay, these were both recorded in one Corinthians. In Corinthians 15, the great doctrines of the church. Christ dying and rising, sent and appearing. Last of all, he appeared to me, says Paul. To all the feel of a creed there in 1 Corinthians 15. I had on the tradition that I received about the nature of Christ, who is the, is the heart of the church. And then the other tradition I hand on that was handed on to me that on the night before he died, Jesus took bread and broke it. And Paul spends a lot of time in Corinthians talking about the Eucharist, the breaking of bread, and the attitude of the people of God when they celebrate it, because it matters very much. He even sort of says that it forms us into the church. The bread which we break is not the body. So we share in it and become what we are, the body of Christ. Now we are not free to say there's something better than that. From my, from my perspective. And I see no real evidence that abandoning those gifts has led to abiding growth and depth, uh, particularly depth. Mm. I'd like to ask about the word growth. We talk about the word old fashioned and, and trust and making use of the gifts which the Lord gives us through His Spirit. What, about, what does growth mean for you in this context? And how does what, it relate to trust? Okay, well, it, 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 I think there are two hopes 
one might have. Uh, we could only have them as hopes, we can't demand them by right. Uh, one is that, that, that we can work for it. One is growth in depth. You know, one of the, for me, one of the lovely metaphors for the church is, is the church as a well. You know, Jacob's well. When the woman goes to the well, Jacob, it's a deep well. And if, you, if you've been to the Holy Land, you get a chance to go to the Holy Land, one of the wonderful things when you go to Jacob's well is that you can draw water from it, go down, 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 and down, and the water comes up and it's fresh and pure and marvelous. It's a deep well. Who wants a church which is like sort of the, the shallow pool at Brunswick Baths? <laughs> I mean, who wants, I, mean, I mean, sometimes I think we as a church, I don't mean to be critical, I don't mean we as a church here, though sometimes, are like we're paddling around in the shallow. We need to be a deep church. A deep church, because in the end, it's only a deep church that can answer the restlessness of Brunswick. Only something deep. I mean, all sorts of other things, messy church, but you'll do what you like. But in the end, there is no substitute for depth. That is why about strap line, which we invented, well, I think I invented, in fact, I stole it. <laughs> I had a told I don't think I have ever admitted this. <laughs> the phrase, enter the mystery, which I have claimed as my invention, was not my invention. I can now admit this because I'm leaving. <laughs> I remember your own. Well, if I ever see it, I want to thank the Welsh Anglo Catholics. <laughs> because it was Welsh Anglo Catholics who, who had a movement called Enter the Mystery. And it seems to me it describes wonderfully that journey into something deep. Into something deep. Because the church is both a horizontal community, here we all are, and not just us, everyone, every Christian, most of whom we've never met and will never met, meet, but who are our brothers and sisters now in Sweden, in Africa, in Indonesia. In Melanesia, brothers and sisters, in the horizontal church, but we're also a deep church. That's the continuity of the tradition and in depth of spirituality. And that has been a key thing for me. But I also have to say, uh, growth in numbers is, our, is always our hope. Bearing in mind, one may sow and another may reap. But growth in numbers, we, do we? Uh, I'm a priest, so I'm uneasy with this. People in the street who aren't believers. I'm not, I'm not content with having a church full of people. I'm thankful. But I'm not content about uneasiness. Because we want people to meet Christ. That's our uh, uh, come and see. Come and, well, come and see, but come and don't see us. Come and meet Jesus, who will be found here. Not contained in the church, of course. But found, found amongst the body of Christ in the ritual actions of the church. So I, I suppose I want both growth in depth, spiritual spirituality. So I, I, I don't think people are really interested in the shadows or entertainment religion. Not really. I, mean, I don't think people will stay in the end. And one of the things about the Eucharist, which is so challenging, is you're constantly presented with the sacrifice of Christ and called to sacrifice yourself. Much easier to just have him along. Oh, go around saying, oh, that, I enjoyed that. Uh, one of the things I used to get really frustrated, I have to say, um, particularly when I was a bishop and there'd be some service or another, and people would come out and say, oh, thank you, I really enjoyed that, as if that's the measurement. It, I don't mean people should you know, <laughs> weep or loathe it. But the measure of worship is not whether we've enjoyed it, but whether we've honoured the Lord. And the greatest gift that any church can give to its local community is its worship, which is not geared toward them, but towards the Lord. And when we offer the Eucharist, when we meet for evening prayer, when we have our church open, I, if you can find me another building in, in this area which is open and unattended, throughout the day. This church is open and unattended, except for the people coming and going. We don't have even parish police people looking suspiciously if someone comes in. It's open and unattended. Every time we worship, 
we are reorienting Brunswick from the world in the Joanine sense of a world that forgets God to a world that is offering its whole self in adoration. And in the Eucharist, it's marvelous because the whole of the created order is involved in even the lowest mass, even in the simplest mass. The stuff of matter in chalice and pattern, the stuff of the earth in red and white, us, believe it or not, the crowning glory of God's creation, and the angels and saints, the invisible world, all together reoriented towards God. It's a protest movement for life and change. Not grumpy protest, loving protest. And if it's two or three, or a hundred, or 150, we must do it. That's what faithfulness is. And we know in the history of the church, sometimes things have gone down to a trickle because of faithfulness. And that, that seems to me has been, and I would say, um, let's look back on it, that that rhythm, you know, and the, the day the Eucharist was sustained here, been in, going on in this parish since I think since the 1960s, and um, when the congregation was quite small in that year before I came, the day the Eucharist was sustained by just two or three or four people. And I honor them for that sustaining, honoring the promise that when two or three are together, God is in the midst. Um, but by God's mercy, and I think by encouraging people and making it normal to have this rhythm, people come. Not in huge numbers. But I think we are, um, I mean, I don't know of another parish which, well, no, there might be one, which has publicly has the daily rhythm that includes evening prayer and intercessions constantly day by day, is open throughout the day. Uh, it's, uh, uh, which brings me to another point, sorry, you haven't asked this question, but, but for me, uh, a parish that is alive is like a, uh, is living the rhythm of life that is different from the world's rhythm. It's almost living the rhythm of a monastery. But it's not like a monastery that's enclosed, it's got perforated boundaries that anyone can come in. The rhythm of life is, is, is almost monastic, if I can put it that way. It's, a, it's not the rhythm of the world. And you can tell that the world's rhythm is interrupted in a very beautiful way when the bell is rung. One of the moments I've really enjoyed over the last eight years is um, the times when I have rung the bell at 6 p.m. for the Ring the Angelus bell. Inevitably, there are people walking past because it's 6 o'clock, and, um, and people look and then they look up. They look up. Lift up your hearts. I mean, most people spend their life like this. <laughs> Walking around the streets, they're headed down. Church's vocation is to raise people's sights. And to pepper the, the, all the sounds, some of them legitimate, some of them pretty unattractive sounds of Brunswick, many of them good sound, sounds, with the sound of the bell of a church reminding people that, well, hopefully they realize it's the church bell. Not so far away from the church, they don't realize it's the church bell. It does sound quite a lot like the tram sometimes. It does sound <laughs> <laughs> It's because like the tram goes at the elevation of it. Okay, ding, 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 ding. Um, and you know, we had, a, we had a guy in the congregation who was playing the trumpet this morning, and he was thinking about becoming a tram driver. And one of my great hopes was that he'd be on another 19 tram. <laughs> <laughs> and when he got to here, he wouldn't say Dawson Street, he'd say Christchurch. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, unfortunately, he decided not to be a not to be a tram driver, but it was one of my little sort of um, <laughs> fantasies. So I think that um, that they're the two sorts of growth. And 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 when I say an old-fashioned church, in some ways, it is old-fashioned to do what we do. It is old-fashioned, uh, and it's, and what is wonderful about it is that uh, the Eucharist, of course, is presided over by priest, that's the priest's task, but evening prayer. It's a lay ministry. It's a ministry of the whole church. And I think that one of the lovely things that's been nice about the parish over the last few years is the growth of, of people involved in ministry and taking initiatives and that I don't, I mean, Thursday, the Thursday lunch, which has been such a turning point in our life. Unwittingly, um, there used to be a sign in the porch, and it didn't 
mean what it said. It said, we can't do anything for you here if you're in need. It, 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 it was just saying that what we can't do. But, um, but over the last few years, and you, some of you are not remembered, will remember that we had the Stuart Lodge people coming on Fridays into the hall. And, that, and then, then when COVID happened, we began doing the Thursday lunch. And that has continued since when, I don't know, 50 or 60 people come and they have a lunch. And, but what it's done for the parish is, is enlivening. For us, it brought more joy. I think that's true. Ruth, it's true, isn't it? Absolutely. It's, 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 um, uh, it's been a wonderful addition to our life and to the authenticity of our life as a church. Uh, because, you know, in a world full of words, even the best words sometimes can't be heard. But when you're doing something, an act of service. Next people know. When people come to the cafe and we explain why it's a social enterprise on Thursdays we do a free lunch, they go, oh, that's great. In other words, when the church is seen to be doing something beyond itself, so it stops being self-serving, but serving beyond, with, with asking nothing from the people who come, except, of course, we receive their friendship, but, but being reverent to one another. That's all we ask. Um, uh, we're, not, we're not seeing them as pew fodder, though we long for them to come to a belief in Jesus Christ. But we don't say, uh, excuse me, um, you only get this food if you come to Mass. Though we long for more to come to Mass. Uh, and we're unafraid to say why we do it. But it's been an enormous gift, not only to us, but to brothers. And you know, in COVID, in COVID, uh, it was really the churches that were doing these things in this neighborhood, actually, for various reasons. And uh, it's a great blessing and is a continuing blessing. And with a lovely team of people who, who give their Thursdays to this uh, gift. Uh, I don't know how I got onto that, actually. But, um, it's something that you touched on in a couple of different ways is how we as a church community here and a church more globally relate to the world, so to speak. Can you talk about that relationship, about what we offer, how you, what, how do we relate to the world, what's, and what's the history of the last eight years been like in terms of our presence on Sydney Road? Yes, well, the shorter answer is, I suppose, as Christians, um, and this is the rub, and it's not easy, that whatever's thrown at us, we throw back love. That's, that's the strategy, actually. Um, and sometimes it's not easy. Um, because you will know that this is pretty stony ground for religious belief. Um, I've often told the story, not in here, but going to one of our Anglican schools and talking to some 14 year olds and um, question and answer session. And um, at the end of it, I said, I've said to them, don't hold back just because I'm a bishop. I need not have worried. <laughs> That's one of the differences between me and Australia. I can tell you, I hate to ask what you are. And they ask me anything they like. But I asked them a question at the end. I said, now just put your hand up if at this stage, it's a 14 year old. If you come to the conclusion that there probably isn't a God. Now over half the kids put their hand up. And I said, well, I want to salute you guys for your willingness to be in the minority. And we're like, oh, oh, oh. I said, I'm not talking Melbourne here, or Australia, I'm talking world. And you need to come to terms, you, you will come to your own conclusion about what you believe. But if you think that any time soon, the rest of the world that are believers are going to grow up and become secular, you're living in Taikuku land, it's not going to happen. And you must learn to respect and understand the belief perspective, whatever conclusion you come to yourself. And I said to the teachers afterwards, with respect, which some of you will know means I'm about to say something or <laughs> touch of critique about it. You are preparing these young people to be adults in Melbourne, and frankly, it's not enough. This is the old tradition. This is a, a great tradition. Um, so we, we're in a in a in a in an area, particularly here, I think, sort of overstated, which is cynical about belief. Um, 
we could have mentioned various things with the failures of the church. Um, uh, but I'm not going to overemphasize that because there's more faithfulness than unfaithfulness in the church. We must not accept the rhetoric that says the church is just all bad. Amen. Not true. Amen. Not true. Uh, so we must own the, the failures. Uh, but there's a lot of cynicism, cynicism about, a lot of just plain not understanding uh, what Christianity stands and means. I have to say, if people think Christianity indoctrinates people, I don't know how secularism does it, or atheism does it, or, or, or materialism does it, but my view just means they're successful. We've got people who've never read the Bible who think it's a load of rubbish. We've got people who've never been to church who think it's boring. Where did they get that from? Where's that coming from? Anyway, that's, it, it's there. So this is stony ground. What softened stony ground? Former Archbishop of Canterbury, Donald Coggan, great preacher. You, he, I think I got this little technique from him. <laughs> Not pointing a finger, but making his point. Only perseverance, only endurance will soften stony ground. And keeping on, loving the world, but saying there is another way of sin. And frankly, with respect, what we believe to be a truer and better way of satisfying life, not just in terms of self-satisfaction, but one that actually is in tune with what human beings are made for. Uh, and to live that life. And uh, you know, one of the things I suppose has been good about, about the initiative of coming onto the Sydney Road and turning this into a cafe, and having a crucifix up there. Remember, we'd only been open about two days. And uh, uh, someone came and said, that should not be there. Two young women came, they had their dog, and they came, and they saw I was wearing a dog color and said, never. Now, I, I don't take, you, you have to not take it personally, but it does, it's good because in the sense that it makes you realistic. Because we could just spend all our time as a sort of hmm. holiness huddle group, or not very holy huddle group, um, and, and without even realizing it, most of the stuff the church does, no one knows about. And you can't look through the windows. I, mean, I love looking, looking through windows. But you can't look through a church window and see what we're doing. And then we go over to the hall. How good has it been having coffee here? I know it's a bit crowded. And we spin outside in the summer. And people walk past and say, oh, my goodness me, what's going on here? And there's kids down there, the kids roaming around and looks uh, uh, all age and, uh, and alive and happy. It's a witness just as we get on doing what we normally do. What a difference has it made from going into the garden centre? I mean, people, why don't people want to go home after coffee? Why don't you people go home after coffee on a Sunday morning? <laughs> no one wants to go. It's my bed. It's beautiful. But it's reorienting the church. This is how we face the world. We face the world with love. With Christ on our hearts. And um, in some ways there's a waiting game. Waiting for questions. What's this about? Someone came in yesterday. Think, I'm right, and said, Oh, what's this about? And she's here tonight. Albert told her, She's here tonight. What's this about? You know, uh, uh, however good a sermon might be, and some of them are very good, if I, <laughs> if I stood on that corner and preached it, no one would hear. No one would hear. Those days are gone. Glory to St. Paul, and actually in great days of Hyde Park Corner and all those sorts of things, and people were interested in ideas and all that sort of but that can't be our way now. So we have to listen to the world and find a way that actually that reveals the cracks in the armor, the chinks in the armor of the world, and lovingly make our way through with a dart of love. With a dart of love. And you know, Brunswick people are not sure they need the church or want the church or even notice the church. Very disconcerting when people say, oh, which church is it? I say, Get that out the window. Where is it? Where, Where is the church? Is that in my mind? Just interesting because, well, actually, um, I didn't know where Bunnings was until I needed Bunnings. Let's face it. Am I the sort of person who's going to spend his rest day <laughs> ogling things in Bunnings? No, I can't even hammer it in there. So until I need it, I don't see it. I don't see it. And that's true. Much. Here, people feel they need coffee. A bit of a problem for me because. I don't really believe in this coffee culture. I mean, when life is a tragedy because my long black is slightly bitter, you know, I think, get alive. 
<laughs> this guy comes in, he has a soy um, chai. And what's it like? <laughs> Cyril, I'll take that as encouragement. It's okay. Well, live with it, honey, because you know it's worse than good life. But it does, people at least know they need coffee. Or think they need coffee. And I don't want to wake up and smell the incense. I'm just waiting to smell the coffee. Um, so it's, it's their territory. But in a sense, it's all our turn. Or rather, it's their territory, they're used to coffee, they're not having to um, redo their self-image by coming in here, maybe a little bit. Um, but they know they need coffee. And, and suddenly, something that they didn't dream of when they woke up that morning happens. They encounter a Christian who is generally unafraid to be one. And so I'll ask questions. What, what do you mean by land and flag? What's, what's that, what does that mean? Or are, are these pictures of where did these come from? These pictures. It's all designed for people to ask a question. And actually, it's quite a lot of things in scripture about that. You know, the Philip ran up to the eunuch and created an environment where the eunuch could ask a question that was on his mind. And for me, that biblical story is a very good one. A story of Philip and the eunuch for the description of what the, um, the mission angle of this particular place has been. In this case, Brunswick is the rich partner. Actually, in terms of strength, in numbers, and feels more power. Philip is the brave, the brave poor man, who goes up to the chair and climbs in, climbs into the territory and sees that the person is, um, uh, as it were, open. And people are at various stages of openness. Sometimes the person has to come in here a number of times before they'll ask a question. Uh, and then Philip is able to just gently reveal, answer the questions. I mean, the asking of questions, I think, is in our culture, Providing places where people can ask questions uh, is good, and as Peter says, we have to be ready to give a reason for the hope that is in us. All of us. Doesn't mean we have to know everything, but we do have to know Christ with the knowledge of the heart. With the knowledge of the heart. The heart knowledge is so important. Knowing Jesus uh, as alive and risen. Being able to say, even to those who are incredulous about it, well, that's what I believe, that's what I live. And there's nothing cringe making about that or inappropriate about it. It's just, and we know that a number of people have found their way to Bible and Beer or into the church. Um, and this is a slow process. Let's be quite clear this is a slow process. It takes perseverance to change stony ground into soft ground. Only perseverance and love hmm. can do that. Would you say that this understanding, this approach to mission is then focused very much on the individual encounter? Or creating opportunities for individual encounter rather than for the, um, the campaign that you look at? Well, it, it's interesting. Um, uh, this is a very different cultural context. I, um, um, I used to go to Africa quite a lot and was um, uh, uh, in Cameroon uh, where I was made an honorary chief of the village, the village of Yagasi. Probably the only Anglican parish church that's um, under the patronage of St. Therese of Lisieux. And it's St. Teresa of Lisieux because it was a Catholic parish. But the chief of the village fell out with the parish priest. So he decided the whole village would be angry. <laughs> and they said, oh, how can we find chief? Is that my <laughs> In other words, it was a sort of corporate identity of, one might say, of the village. And um, you got the chief and you got, this was true for my great, great, great grandfather. In, in among the Maori people, first mission on the South Island of New Zealand, 
and the conversion of a chief changed life. Get the chief, you get the Now, we, we live in a much more highly individualistic world. I mean, there's, I mean, those of us who are old enough to remember David Beckham, do you remember David Beckham? Footballer? If he shaved his head, then kids all over the world shave their heads. Okay? That was, a, that was a, he was a sort of, what do you call those? Um, trend set. Um, but by and large, by and large, um, when it comes to the faith in our culture, it is one by one. One by one. Um, and um, Queen Victoria once said she didn't like, I think with one of her prime ministers, Benjamin Disraeli, I think, I don't want to do him down. She said, Mr. Disraeli always talks to me as if I'm a crowd, never as an individual. Jesus worked one by one. The saviour of the whole human race so often worked one by one and didn't make people feel he'd rather be somewhere else. Is it? There's only once when he looks over a person and says, where are the others? Do you remember that story? Only once does Jesus look over the head of someone and say, where are the others? With the ten letters. The nine who didn't come to but in his case, Jesus was able to look over his shoulder and attend to the one. And uh, I learned early on when, when my confessor came to preach in this parish I was in in South London for Holy Week, my last Holy Week there. And we had services every night, and I was neurotic, and people wouldn't come. How many were going to come? How many were going to come? How many were going to come? And on the Monday night, when he preached wonderfully, the marvelous preacher, and that afterwards, when we were having a whiskey, Probably we shouldn't have done in Holy Week, but anyway, we're away from whiskey. And he said, Lindsay, 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 I knew I was coming He said, You spent the whole of this evening think about the people who weren't there instead of blessing God for the ones who were. I hope you'll put that in your next confession. <laughs> and I did. And I've never forgot. The one. Attending to the one. Most growth is one by one. Though it does have to be said, we all know this. If, if and this is one of, in evangelism, this is one of the sort of um, perseverance. Talking about perseverance, and we've talked about this a lot in the parish, of which I will bless God when I leave this parish for the people who week by week by week by week prepared stuff, ready for any children to come, with no complaint. No saying, even the type who said, oh, should we stop this, is it worth it, should we just do it once a month? None of those people said, no, 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 yeah, that's, you know, not going to happen. And because of their perseverance, you found us here. It's easy. Because of that perseverance. Stony ground only becomes soft through perseverance. And what a blessing it is. It's a wonderful parable about what perseverance and generosity of heart can do to create a community that brings forth more generosity. Amen. And that, that seems to me, um, I remember saying, um, you know, why, why would anyone come here? It's a good question to ask in the parish community. Uh, and if there's, if we de develop the church that says, well, it's only human to have rounds. No, it's less than human. Christ reveals what being human is. And I have to say, one of my policies early on, and I think I got away with it more because I'm a bishop, was zero tolerance about inappropriate Christian talk, or inappropriate talk that was some Christian. And it needed to be named occasionally, with love. We do not do that here. That is not acceptable. And that's part of leadership, actually. Um, and sometimes it's hard but it does need to be said. Zero tolerance on ungodly talk among the people of God. Um, and because you know how powerful we are, we all influence things, we learn in the school playground how we can influence things. A PCC, a parish council, can be influenced by one person going, it can change the whole thing and kill a good idea. Kill an initiative. 
initiative. And that, a, a Christian community needs to put itself under a discipline, or at least the, the core, as people are discovering what it really means to be a Christian and live in a Christian community. No. What, what it means to live in a Christian community is what we have to manifest. What we have to manifest. If we are just like everyone else, we will say, well, who is this Jesus Christ? What do you mean? What do you mean he's affecting your life? What do you mean you probably get? You people can't even get on with each other. No one even said hello to me when I came in here. No one was ready for us. And that's the other strategy, which I hope continues. Every Saturday night, a few people pray, Lord, bless us tomorrow. Please, with someone they're not expecting, either someone returning or someone we've not met before. But only, only, only our blessing if we are ready, if we are ready to give them your gift to us. And if the gospel will be authentically preached. So our prayer has a caveat. But it, since that prayer has started, I do believe that's one of the turning points in the growth of this prayer. I've said to many, many of my brothers and sisters in the clergy, where many parishes are struggling for growth, we know that. And I say, do you pray for it? Do you pray? And even if it doesn't seem as happening, will you keep praying? Back to the gates of heaven. Why should God answer your prayer immediately anyway? Who do you think you are? I mean, keep on. Keep on. And I think that, that that's a, a spiritual strategy that in, I think has been very important here, along with that one about with the children and the daily rhythm, keeping on with the daily rhythm, sometimes there only being one or two, and then suddenly you have a Thursday evening when there's 12 people. Oh, where's that come from? Praise God. Uh, it, 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 comings and goings is just the way of things. And this is the other challenge for parish in terms of growth, is, is that we don't live in a settled community anymore. We've got, we've got one family here that's been here for 90 years, the Vincent family. 100 years. 100 years they've been coming to this church in generations. That is now finishing. Well, who of the people who live in Brunswick now will be living here, well, in 100 years, <laughs> but in generational terms? It's, it, this, this is a moving sort of place. That's the sort of place it is. So how does the church find its stability? Um, when it's not the same people. Actually, there are disadvantages about being the same people over a long period of years, actually. Because even though there can be empty pews, it can sometimes not be easy to join because of the long common history, which, can, which is very beautiful, but can overwhelm or become more important or seemingly more important than the common faith in Jesus Christ, the common, the common longing for and uh, in a parish, this can manifest itself when someone gives a notice and says, if you want a ticket, ask Mary. And they don't think there's anyone in the church who doesn't know who Mary is, or Jean, or whoever it is. Uh, makes assumptions uh, that you all know, we all know, or whatever. And, and that, um, how do we find the stability in the midst of the changes and chances? It's not a Sunday when our congregation is exactly the same. Hmm. For which I thank God. Thank God that you know you never quite know who's going to turn up, and and I think we have got better. The people of God have got better. I do not feel now that if I don't welcome people, they won't get welcomed. In other words, it doesn't always have to be the priest who does the welcoming. Actually, it was Albert's idea to have people standing outside the church when he came here as a reading student. One of his great contributions to the life of this parish to suggest that we do that, and now. Sometimes I have to prompt people. Sometimes I have to say to Mason, oh, see that person over there, Mason? God's calling you to go and say hello to him. <laughs> <laughs> he says, oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, even Jesse, I say that to him. Oh. <laughs> but, but they go. <laughs> and each time, I mean, you always got a business deal out of one of those people. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> so now, I think um, one of the hopeful things about the life in the parish here is that is that there is a greater sense of responsibility among us all for that gathering folk in, for welcoming, for 
for inviting me. Um, you know, I think. Um, so although I have a very high doctrine of ordained ministry and of the high, proper hierarchy of the church, and uh, as you all know, those of you who are here, I'm not afraid of exercising the authority that I have, the appropriate authority I have. Um, but I believe passionately in the ministry of every baptized person and encouraging that ministry, um, allowing people time to discover it um, and, and to learn that actually God will surprise them with the things they can do for him. Um, I don't suppose eight years ago, when you were singing in the choir, you could have imagined that the next couple of weeks time you'd be ordained. And in a small way, I think I can speak for you, a small way Christ Church has participated in, in, in that imagining. I mean, the number of times you ask me to do something, I said, no, I don't think I can. You say, right, it's going to be next Sunday, and you'll do it. <laughs> That is true, because we all like our comfort zone, actually. But who could get baptized and think they're going to stay in their comfort zone? Mm. I mean, what would be the... Cast out into the deep. Yeah, cast out into the deep. Who of the apostles could have imagined if they said, Oh, no, Jesus, I don't feel like it today. <laughs> no, I don't think that's my gift. <laughs> no. I I, who would <laughs> say that to the Lord of heaven and earth? And, and what would they get in reply in any case? <laughs> That, that, looked at them. that same, that same um, confessor who said to me, uh, Lindsay, 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 uh, used to be a mission priest and he used to take people on teams to parishes. And he was on some mission and there were some nuns with him and lay people. There. And some atlas nun came in exhausted because <laughs> they'd all been given visiting lists for the afternoon. She said, Oh, Father, Father Augustine, I can't possibly, I'm exhausted. And he just went, For him. And off she went out into the streets to do music for him, for him, not for me, but for him, for him. He gives the energy uh, to keep on keeping on and will to the people of God in that's it. You know? But most of the things, so a priest said to me not too long ago, oh, the thing is, Lindsay, uh, Christchurch is the Lindsay Irwin show, and it's your quirkiness. It is not. It is the Catholic religion lived locally. I have introduced no novelty to this parish at all. None at all. Renewal, yes, but not novelty. Not novelty. Okay? So I'm a barista. I learned to be a barista not because I wanted to, but because it was necessary. It was necessary for me. It won't be necessary for the next priest. Who knows how this place is going to emerge and develop as time goes by. As, the, as it were, the front door onto Christchurch Bromley, or another door onto Christchurch Bromley. Who knows? Who knows? That's up to the Lord, or up to wait on the Lord to discover. But we, that, I, I, I defy anyone to say that this parish is not old fashioned. It's an old fashioned parish with an old fashioned priest, uh, for which I make no apology. What a wonderful thing that the last thing I should do here is to baptize, mm. to baptize some of the children, the people here, and confirm. And uh, mates of yours who you brought here, Jess, and uh, we will be baptizing and confirming. From your invitation and encouragement to come here, not mine, yours. So you have, uh, if you knew the joy you've given to heaven, by saying to Carlo, oh, why don't you come along? Whatever you think about your life, you are given more joy to heaven than perhaps anything else you've done than to bring one person. And that wasn't me. It wasn't me. Very important to, to see that going, going forward. Mm. Give me that old time religion could be my chorus, but it's absolutely contemporary because it's alive with the Spirit of God. It's alive with His Spirit. Yeah, does anyone want to ask any questions or anything? I there is, or we can, we can just. Or we can have conversation over. Um, uh, 
and we may continue this on another session. Do you want to talk about strategy? Yes, and I think it would be worth it. I would want to meet again yeah, next week nice. about the mission action plan and the point of that and and, and how fruitful that's been. Actually, we're running out of time now. No, no. no. Um, you have none? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, yes, because the mission action plan, which we set some years ago, 2019, I think, or maybe before then, earlier than that, um, was a very helpful because not only set us with with plans, but also set us free from doing everything. Mm. No, we can't do that now, but in two years' time, we'll try and do it then. And then asking ourselves, well, why haven't we done that? There may be a very good reason. Think of plans that were set before COVID, then COVID comes along, and everything gets thrown up. Mm. Now, we have just about recovered after COVID in terms of attendance, though the attendance has changed. Um, there's been a long haul to recover um, the lost ground of the people of God not being able to meet together in, uh, for mass. It's been a, um, so I think it's worth looking at some of that up um, and maybe have more questions. Great.